Good day and welcome back to the 40 Audio Podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. And today we're going to be covering the topic of sleep. Last episode, we talked to Emma Stone, which was a very enlightening episode where we were talking about cerebral palsy, sort of the lived experience angle of that. Well, today we're going to be talking about sleep, which is something I think a lot of neurodivergent and autistic people could struggle with. And this is going to be the second appearance of our guest, of course, from Neurodivergent Insights, Dr. Megan Neff, which is going to be a really great episode. I'm hoping that I can take some tips about sleep or have a bit more of an understanding about it. Without further ado, let us introduce Megan. Hello, Megan. How are you doing? Hello. Great to be back with you. I'm doing, I don't know. Never ask me that question. I never know how I'm doing. <laughs> The alexithymic haze. Of, yes, yeah. exactly. The alexithymic, um, how in the world do I summarize all of all of the things? Well, I'm here. This is your second appearance on the 40 OT podcast. What what I'd like to know is what, what have you been up to since we last did one of our episodes? Yeah, it was. That was probably about over a year ago. Um, so I guess kind of big things is I've, I've gone from full time with neurodivergent insights and writing. And so that's been a fun, um, like career shift and self-care mm. for autistic people just came out last month, um, which was really exciting. And also, yeah, kind of like you, I don't know that I always access those emotions of excitement, but I know up here, that's an exciting thing <laughs> to have happened. Um, yeah. So writing, speaking, um, continuing to learn. I just, I, I like what I do because I just get to keep learning and going on random deep dives into things, all things neurodivergent. Yes. I think we, we share that, that interest. Um, I have realized that for, for anybody who hasn't watched the previous podcast, which I, I highly recommend that you do, um, at least after this, um, could, would you be able to give us a bit of a sort of a brief introduction into the kind of work that you've done and like what kind of stuff you do online. Yeah. So, um, about three or four years ago, I started neurodivergent insights after discovering, um, that one of my children and myself were autistic and just realizing like, wow, so much of what I experienced in my training did not prepare me to see this either in myself or my child. So I think the thing I'm most known for, I haven't I actually don't make many original ones anymore. I'd like to, but I make Venn diagrams, Misdiagnosis Monday, where I compare um, autism and ADHD with other conditions. And my whole reason I set out to do that was I had this realization of there's a lot of undiagnosed autistic ADHD adults, but they're in therapy. So they're getting diagnosed with yeah. something. And so that is really kind of the, I guess, the cornerstone of at least how I started was wanting to increase awareness around that. I've kind of pivoted to, I do a lot around neurodivergent wellness and adapting, like taking psychological principles and then adapting them for neurodivergent minds. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, so I think a lot about how do we take these ideas and then make them work for our brains. Hmm. And most recently I'm also gotten into community building. So I run a community um, of autistic ADHD adults and also co-host a podcast Divergent Conversations where we're both um, autistic ADHD mental health therapists talking about kind of our experience but then also giving the clinical lens so that's yes I think I remember, a bit of I remember what I do on, uh, that podcast. yeah you came on we talked about alexithymia yeah yes yeah, yeah. My, my favorite yeah. topic <laughs> yes I, I have a mixed relationship to it. I mean, I, I like talking about it, but also like it's really annoying to live with. <laughs> yes, it definitely is, and especially when it comes to like the the aspects of like therapy and stuff. Like I, I always think about sort of my time going through the psychological roots as a as a child, and just you know getting getting loads of techniques to use to manage my emotions and not being able to manage them properly because I didn't realize that I was feeling anxious or mm -hmm. like, you know, talking very bluntly and just openly about 
like awful things that I've experienced and just having no yep. emotional processing that goes on with it. It's, it's very, it's like, well, um, today we're going to be talking about sleep. And I, I think this is a very apt time for us to talk about it because last night or the other night before, actually, I didn't get any sleep. And at the moment being like in my, literally zero. Yes. I had zero. Oh had zero my goodness. Sleep. That is <laughs> atrocious. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It was all right. I mean, look, the, the um, chat got to see um, Thomas in a very sort of, you know, when you get sort of sleep deprived and you, you find everything really funny, you get just a little <laughs> yeah. bit. So yeah. We watched a bunch of memes, um, meme <laughs> videos on the on the stream the other night, which was, was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, uh, good sleep last night. However, waking up, executive functioning, all of that stuff is... Really, really big issue for me. So I suppose a good place to start would be um, like just talking generally about sleep because like mm -hmm. I think most people know that, you know, sleeping like a certain amount of time every night is good for you and it sort of like resets your brain and stuff. But I'd like to understand a bit more about like why why we do it and mm -hmm. why it's beneficial for us to get like a nice amount of sleep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I wish I had, like, thought ahead to a good metaphor here. Um, okay, imperfect, but I almost think of it like the cleanse cycle on, if you were to do a cleanse cycle on your oven or your dishwasher, um, like, to kind of clean out stuff. Sleep is kind of like a cleanse cycle that our body does. So it, it cleans out certain neurotransmitters um, when we're in sleep. It also, like, helps with other neurotransmitters, so, like, serotonin, all this stuff that's good for mood. Um so there's a lot of neurochemical things that depend on good sleep and are impacted by it. So that's where, so I actually mm. used to work, um, I used to work in a hospital setting and I worked in OBGYN for a long time. So I worked with a lot of new parents and a lot of parents who were experiencing like postpartum depression. My number one intervention at that time was like, you need one full sleep cycle. So like three mm. and a half to four hours is, is a full sleep cycle. So if, if someone was showing up with anxiety or depression and in that, you know, perinatal period or postpartum period, it, the first thing is just let's get you a sleep cycle. Um, and a lot of neurodivergent people also struggle to get like a full sleep cycle or to get sleep. So when that's often one of my first like line of defenses for mental health mm -hmm. is if someone's struggling with depression, anxiety, and they're not sleeping well is actually let's, let's get your sleep on track. Cause just on a neurochemical level, there's so much that happens. Um, that's a Beyond really big that, impact, doesn't it? Like, um, huge, huge, absolutely, yeah. And it's not just because, like, oh, I'm tired. It's be it's because of like the the impact on our chemistry. Um, the, we also like take our memories um, that we've kind of been holding that day, and it, and it goes into long term memory during the process of sleep. Mm. So, like, I have very little memories of when my kids were zero to five, and it's because I was sleeping horrifically. And a lot of those memories just weren't getting placed into long-term memory. So it also impacts memory and learning. Um, so if we're like a student and we're struggling to sleep, but maybe, and we're studying and we're trying to get that information into our long-term memory, that's also going to impact like our mm -hmm. studies. Um, so yeah, sleep is really, really significant. And it's really, really hard for most autistic and ADHD people. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an interesting one. Like, um, I suppose a, a sort of a, a good sort of follow-up question would be, you know, what, why is sleep necessarily more, more difficult for us? I mean, like, I know for, for myself, um, just just at baseline with no medication, anything like that, uh, I really struggle getting to sleep. Mm -hmm. But with the with the medication that I'm on, I'm on like a, a sedative sort of sedative medication called met metazapine and it has like a very very long half-life so it pretty much just sedates me throughout the day but it also like the morning after waking up after after having it every single time feels like i've just gone on like a so, some kind of drug-fueled two-day bender or like a, <laughs> having a that's, so, that's so interesting yeah that, this would be an interesting survey because i know when i take like I get, I can tolerate 
melatonin. Um, but when I take over the counter sleep aids, like the next day I feel so sluggish. Um, autistic people often do have more sensitivity to medication. So uh, yeah, I'd be curious to do a poll of people, like how many can actually take some of those sleep medications without just feeling. Um, the one that I have found, I don't know why, but Theraflu. So it sounds so messed up, but when I get a cold, I get kind of excited because I'm like, oh, I can take Theraflu, like nighttime Theraflu, and I want to get a really good night's sleep. <laughs> Is and it the I'm drowsy gonna... version or something? It's like Yeah, it's the drowsy yeah. version. I don't know why, but if for some reason that is the one that like will put me to sleep and I don't feel terrible the next day. Um, but yeah, it, it, knowing we're more sensitive to those, to those things that kind of suppress our system. I think it's obviously wise to be thoughtful about that. So I, I do, I do know that I have saw, seen some studies particularly around autism and like melatonin, like mm -hmm. the, like I know that the, the common device that people give for, for people is to avoid like blue light exposure because mm -hmm. there's like receptors in our eyes which um like melatonin production is inhibited by when we sort of see mm -hmm. blue light so it gives us this slight circadian rhythm but i have i've heard that autistic people don't produce as much or like maybe yeah yeah would it be helpful for me to go through kind of like the different ways or reasons why sleep can be hard for us. Like a yeah, that would, that would be great. Okay. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking I use bucket metaphors all the time. So I guess I'm thinking in buckets here again too, but like, so medical. So we know in general, autistic people and ADHD are just more vulnerable to all kinds of medical conditions. So gut autoimmune, um, mm. so many things, but including that are some sleep issues. So things like sleep apnea or any, any like breathing airway obstruction, that whole class of disorders. And it's, um, so there could be a medical reason. Other medical, like restless leg syndrome is more common among us. Yeah. Um, so that I always recommend if someone, especially if someone is actually getting like eight hours of, eight to nine hours of sleep and they're still waking up exhausted, I recommend people see if they can do a sleep study and look, at, look into medical reasons. Um, mm. So that is one piece is co-occurring medical conditions impacting sleep. Um, then if we go over here to genetics, there are a few like, it's so weird. technically they're gene, gene mut mutations. I always feel weird saying gene mutations when talking about autism or ADHD because I don't think of our neurotype as a mutation, but technically gene mutations that yeah. impact can impact either melatonin or circadian rhythm. So with melatonin, what it can happen is sometimes what's called a flattened me melatonin curve. So ideally right. you have kind of a nice um, big curve, like it hits, a, you know, at in, that time, in the nighttime like, mm -hmm. and it signals like, okay, it's time, it's time for my body to go to sleep. Um, and so for a lot of autistic people, we might have a flattened curve. So we're not getting that same, that same signal of it's, t it's time to sleep. Or we can have circadian rhythm disruptions. So that might be, and this is seen a lot with ADHDers particularly, where it's just like a, their natural circadian rhythm for some people might be to go to bed at 4 a.m. and wake up at 11. But our That's world mine. doesn't always work like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, That's, just it's, is that your circadian rhythm? I, I, I have no idea. I think I must be running on like, I think my circadian rhythm is running on like a 25 hour clock. Like natu naturally, if I just mm -hmm. let my, I, I need a lot of sleep for some reason, like li like 10 hours. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very frustrating because I know you can probably identify with the, the need to sort of, the, the, the desire to sort of stay productive and like, you know, work on Absolutely. your own business and stuff. But um, is that, is, is the, the length of sleep, which I did, I did maybe see something about the length of sleep required might be a bit different. Oh, so, so yeah. So we on average, like our, so, okay. We have a lot of issues falling asleep. The other thing, okay. I'm diverging for a second. The other thing I just want to name is like co-occurring mental health conditions, yes, which we know we have a lot of. Yeah. So anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, these things also impact sleep. So like anxious mind, you know, the mind is a sneaky little thing. Like as soon as we lie down in bed, 
the mind's like, oh, I have an audience. So I'm going to start chatting at you. So if we have an anxious mind, that can absolutely impact sleep. That, that, that um, the like default mode network stuff, like resting um, brain state thing. I don't know if it's connected to that. It, it might be. Um, I was just thinking more about like chatty kind of monologues that when we're anxious, we ha- we tend to have a lot of chatty thoughts yes. um, and ruminate. And then sensory stuff is also obviously going to impact sleep. Okay. But what you were saying about length of sleep. So falling asleep is harder, but also our quality of sleep tends to be less. So like we autistic people tend to spend less time in REM sleep. REM is that really kind of deep Mm -hmm. restorative sleep. So I think average person spends about 25% of their time in sleep. And one study found we spend about 15%, which would mean we would need more time sleeping to get the same amount of REM sleep. Does that, is that maybe what you're thinking of? Yeah. I'm just thinking as well, like it's like diverging things in my brain, like thinking about particular sort of substances that, because there's like a crossover between ADHD and autism and like addiction and stuff. And, there's a lot of substances out there which like decrease REM sleep as well. So I am just matching yeah. situation like you know. mm-hmm. that would be another one I think we should add to that is like co-occurring substance um, abuse issues hmm. because um, we know that that's really high in our population and understandably like um, a lot of us are using a lot of us go to substances to try to downregulate our nervous system. Um, and then, yeah, it creates new issues like sleep and it becomes this whole cycle. And I think it's a cycle that um, is really understandable and and mm. hard for a lot of us to break. A lot of people in the chat are saying that they, that so someone bought a sleep on ring um, showed that they got about nine to 11% REM sleep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's Someone right. said that they've they spent eleven days before and with no sleep. <laughs> oh my! That would send a lot of people into like psychosis. I would think. Yeah, I could have. <laughs> that's rough. Wow. Mm. It can be yeah. dangerous as well. Like that. That. The oh yeah. Sort of, mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I, I that wasn't a joke. Like it literally can send us into psychosis when we aren't yeah. getting um, sleep. I never had that. Um, I have, I think, the longest I ever stayed awake for was maybe two and a, two and a half days. It was because I was traveling for like a long time, but I really struggle sleeping in public because I'm like hyper aware of like the vulnerable state that I'm in when I'm mm-hmm. when I'm in public, and it's like. Um, but that 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 was, I think, the, the most that I've ever got from not sleeping was just feeling exceptionally giddy like i've never Mm -hmm. had any hallucinations or anything much Mm -hmm. yeah well um i suppose now that we understand like a little bit about why it might be more difficult for us i think what one last thing that i might suggest in terms of difficulties is like the executive function around sleep schedules and things like i can imagine that if you struggle to detransition from working or like doing a hobby or something to sleep or you try and struggle transitioning from your bed to starting your day like that that can sort of impact like your sleep hygiene and stuff right Absolutely. do you think that 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 could also be a factor for sure yeah like the the hype the tendency to hyper focus um like that that a lot of my bad sleep spirals start that way is I got really hyper focused into a project, stayed up late, and then it starts off a bad sleep cycle where the next day I maybe take a nap, I do extra coffee, and then I have a harder time falling asleep the next day, and then it spins into an insomnia loop. Um, so absolutely That's so relatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, and it often goes back to one of those neurodivergent traits. It's like, well, that was the domino that then Mm. and so i talk a lot about okay know your sleep triggers like know the things that start off one of those spirals and then know the resets so like for Mm. me if i'm in a in a spiral sometimes a reset might be like okay i'm gonna power through today without extra coffee without a nap i'm gonna do a walk because i know that's gonna help my body be tired um 
to be, try to catch the spiral before it really spins. Oh, sorry. I'm diverging all over the place. Sorry, Thomas. Okay. Um, so change. Good. I love it. Whenever <laughs> I experience change in my life, that often will um, lead to a season of insomnia for me. And I've noticed that's also really common for autistic people. Like big yeah. life changes. Yeah, that, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because <clears throat> I've, I've seen other people sort of describe the way that we set up routines as sort of being like a step-by-step -step kind of process. Like, I know that you, usually there is something in my day, which is the gym, which sort of sets up my entire evening to a certain degree. So, like, if I don't go to the gym, like, usually, usually my routine is I go to the gym, I have a shower, I brush my teeth... I put on my skincare stuff. I get, I go, I, I mean, I brush my teeth before because sometimes I can't executive function myself out to brush my teeth again after I eat. It's a weird thing. Um, so then, <clears throat> so that, so then that kind of kicks off my routine to get everything done before I need sleep. But if I don't go to the gym one day, because I don't know, I work, I work up late and I've got a deadline to do. It's, it's like the whole routine just falls and I'm just sort of left in mm -hmm. what you were saying, that kind of anxious, like, um, default mode network kind of experience where there's just so many chatters and thoughts and I just can't like, you, you get yep. into decision paralysis. We are such delicate creatures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like one thing gets off and it's like, okay, it's, it's all, it's all gone. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yeah. I relate. Well, what what are some steps that we can take to improve sleep? Because I know you was you were talking about like a reset and mm -hmm. and such, but mm -hmm. it'd be nice, good to know. And um, maybe we could try yeah, share, bringing share, up share. Me. Uh huh. Um. So. Okay. Yeah. First, I'll just share like this is how I visualize the sleep spiral, like where you know, day one, hyper fixated on a project. So then I, I just, I talk about mapping things a lot, whether we're mapping our nervous system or mapping our sleep. So I think the first place to start after you is identifying your spirals. Cause again, I think because of how our brains work, we tend to have a lot of, um, kind of vulnerable areas for spirals, whether mm. it's, I always forget how to say it, revenge, procrastination, sleep, sleep, revenge, <laughs> procrastination, or hyperfixation, um, and then identifying your resets. So that's just kind of bird eye view is knowing what makes you vulnerable to bad sleep cycles. And then also what your resets are. Mm. Um, the, and then here's the thing I talk about a lot is, um, and this is back when I used to do behavioral psychology. So that was when I was working in, in hospitals with folks, I would draw from well, I've, I've added some for autistic people, but I would draw from sleep, these like six sleep buckets, as in these are different ways you can support your sleep. Now it's gonna, mm -hmm. where you wanna start depends on the cause of your sleep issue. So this is also assuming that your sleep issue is not medical, right? So these are all what's called behavioral strategies to support sleep. Sure. Um, so the sensory supports, that's the one I've added for autistic people. like just we want our sleep environment to be really sensory soothing and then identifying if there are, are noises or things waking us up so um, for me that that yeah. would be like having a fan on in the evening mm -hmm. yep yeah. exactly yeah like for me i've got like a, a really good blackout mask that blocks out light i have i have earplugs and a white noise machine like I'm just, I work so hard to block out all of the things. I still, I still get woken up by the birds, but, yeah. um, you already mentioned sleep hygiene and sleep routine, mm -hmm. and those are just kind of basic sleep principles. Um, but I think they matter more for us in the sense that because we don't necessarily get those internal cues of tiredness, if we have a flattened melatonin curve, or just if we have differences in interoceptive awareness. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, we need yeah. more of those external cues. So when we have a sleep routine over time, the body learns like, Oh, this is my signal. It's time to go to sleep. So I think, I think sleep hygiene and sleep routines are harder for us. I also think they're more important for us. Um, so those are two. And then relaxation strategies. So, you know, in our last 
podcast we did together on trauma, we talked about the nervous system a lot. So mm -hmm. what often happens when we're in a bad sleep cycle is our sympathetic nervous system starts getting activated because we're stressed about the fact we're not the sleeping. Like, um, That's exciting. like the fight, flight, stress. It's like adrenaline's going up, cortisol's going up. We can't fall asleep when we're sympathetic dominant. So having some of those relaxation strategies that activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest part of our nervous system, is really, really essential, especially for neurodivergent people because we do have that more sensitive nervous system that mm. tends to be in stress more often. Um, yeah, I've seen some some stuff about that, like with the like cortisol, like the stress the stress hormone being sort of increased more for autistic people and like lasting longer. And I know that like mm -hmm. cortisol is yeah. sort of a root of a lot of medical related things too. Absolutely. That's part of like, so we know that there's that link with all extra medical conditions for us and stress and cortisol is a big, it's not the only reason, but that's a big piece of the link mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. Um, and then the other two sleep stimulus Maybe, okay, how do I bird eye view this? Maybe we can talk about this one more in depth in a minute, but this has to do with um, neuroplasticity and neural binding. Yeah, let's let's talk about that in a minute. Let's just um, put a note on that. But at that, we want our brain to associate the bed with sleep. So there's some mm -hmm. ways we can do that. Um, and then CBTI, this one's interesting. I don't normally recommend CBT for autistic people. This is the one exception. Um, so this is where you identify the stress thoughts with sleep um, and you you work to make them more gentle. Again, we're thinking about that nervous system. If I'm lying in bed and I'm like, I'm going to be so miserable tomorrow, I'm never falling asleep. Think about what that's doing to your nervous system, right? It's yeah. making it more stressed. So and so we think about like your oh my God, I really need to get to sleep right now. And like, <laughs> I've, got to, I've got so much work to do tomorrow. And it's like, you're just hyping yourself up for the next day before you actually fall asleep. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and then you're not going to fall asleep because your body's in stress mode. So it's, and it's not about like, we don't want to be deceptive with ourselves. We don't want to lie to ourselves. Um, actually, maybe I can find some examples I have. Um, what we want to do is, have we just want to make the thoughts more gentle but but we have to believe them right like we can't replace it with like oh, i'm gonna feel great tomorrow so like i will never fall asleep to i will eventually fall asleep or like i'm gonna feel miserable tomorrow i have survived hard days before um but the the part that's really important when doing cbt anything is that the kind of reframed more gentle thought is something that is believable yeah um, and if that doesn't work for people, then I think distraction techniques work really well. And my favorite is something called cognitive shuffling. Okay. That was like the bird eye view. And then I'll, I'll, you can feel free to ask about any of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think um, when you were talking about, I know you said you were going to talk about, shall I um, sort of get, get rid of the graphic or are you wanting to keep um, it Yeah. I, I mean, we, I, yeah, I think we could probably get rid of it. Okay. I can bring it back at any point. <laughs> um, I think when, when you, I know you said you were going to touch on sleep stimulus before, but I know that um, what, one of the issues, particularly for me, like working from home is like, I don't really have many sort of environmental shifts and yes. I like, and f for me, my sensory haven, the place that relaxes me the most if I'm stressed is my bedroom. So yes, like, I know, I know that that's absolutely. not, it's not a good thing, but uh -huh. um, I, I have like a color changing lights in, in my room. And if I, if I do spend time in my room when I'm not trying to go to sleep, um, I usually have it on like the white setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm going to go to sleep, I've set it, set it on a timer to like turn orange to like, give myself some sort of st st stimuli to like tell my brain, okay, right. I need to wind down kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're building in cues for your brain 
And that's really important. Um, I actually, I literally, it, I love that you said that because in the chapter on sleep, I have, um, so I'm, the, these graphics are coming from, I'm working on a workbook with Simon and Schuster on autistic burnout. And these are from the sleep chapter. Um, but I have a box in there on autistic considerations for sleep stimulus because mm -hmm. so many of us retreat to our bedrooms as a sensory, like our sensory haven. Um, and so that absolutely complicates the sleep bed mm -hmm. association. It's also not realistic for many of us not to do that. So we have to figure out ways to work with that. I love how for you, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm finding other ways to cue to my brain that this is different now. Um, I think another I way of doing that. Room. That would be great. If I just had like a, a sense or like a swing or something that I could just like mm -hmm. go in and just like listen to music and just sit in my swing and just like, <laughs> I wish I had that though. That sounds incredible. I wish I had that too. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one thing I do try to recommend for folks is if space allows as much as possible, don't make the bed the sensory place, but like have a really comfortable chair or like I love, I have a moon pod I love. It's like a beanbag chair, but it's zero mm -hmm. gravity or just like having a, even if it's just a chair next to the bed, but you obviously the want it to be pod. comfortable. But it, at bare minimum, if we can protect bed for sleep, that is going to help a lot with um, insomnia and sleep and restlessness. Wow. Moon pod. Oh, that does look very comfortable. It's, yeah. I So I'll like sit on that and then I'll put my weighted blanket on it and then my headphones with my stem song. And that's that's my like sensory happy place. Well, um, I suppose now, now that we've got some... Well, I think I think my last question was looking looking at the workbook. So, so maybe maybe do you, should we pull up your workbook again? Sorry, I'm a little bit all over oh, sure. the place. So I Did you want to? Um, so I have, I guess it's complex. The thing I was just showing you. This is from my upcoming. Um, this is from my upcoming book with Simon and Schuster on autistic burnout. This is just a chapter of it. I think for the workbook, maybe what you're referring to is the workbook I have up on my website, yes. which I think you actually have the um, the screen for. So yeah, that's the workbook where I go into all of these different sleep buckets and how, and I'm actually, I'm in the middle of redesigning it. These are my, this was one of the first workbooks I ever made it, I ever made. And so I'm in the middle of in, yeah. improving the design, but yes, I go into all of these sleep buckets there. And is the stuff that we watched um, on, so it watched on, watching your screen, is that from this the sleep guide um, or like a lot of it is drawn from that but it's um it's a, it's a, i've redesigned it and consolidated it um it's much shorter in what i was showing on my screen oh very cool well um definitely go go check out um megan's website neurodivergent insights and also the instagram account i know that you do you do also have um a podcast and stuff but um, I, I think I, I quite often, uh, I quite often talk about you when it comes to like autism related things, because I think that one of, one of the things that is on my like list of like goals in terms of like making life easy for autistic people is to have more neurodivergent, like pe people who understand both like the scientific and the the sort of lived experience angles to, to autism. Um, I think, cons you know, considering like the statistics around like life quality and all of the co-occurring things that we can experience, I think it's very important. Um, so I think, I think you're, you're an exemplar, exem exemplary, is that the right word? I think you're that a great the right word. That's, that's <laughs> very kind of you. I will, I will, I will work to take in your compliment. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I suppose, is there anything else that you, you'd like to cover when it comes to sleep or is that? Um, I'll just mention, I also have a lot of free resources. So I know you just, that you just showed that workbook. Um, but I also have like free blog posts. And if you scroll way back on my Instagram, I have several series on sleep. So I just want to highlight that there's also some free resources out there as well, where I, do more of this deep dive. Very cool. Very cool. 
I do. I do have some time for some questions. If there's any questions you want me to answer from, so you see, that's a good idea. <laughs> that is a very good idea. I think we we did have some some people. So if if you guys have got any questions that you want to ask around sleep, oh yeah, there's someone who said that coffee makes them sleepy. I have heard that a uh -huh. like a few times from my ADHDers. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've heard that from ADHDers. It's it's so interesting how like our brains and our bodies just respond so differently hmm. to some of these things. Someone said that microdosing helps them with sleep quality. <laughs> Someone <laughs> said that uh, Brie asks, "I'd like to know more about the vagus system, nervous system theories like polyvagal and somatic experiencing mm -hmm. therapy." Any considerations? Yeah, I have a lot of um, articles I could link to, but uh, yeah, I talk about the neurodivergent nervous system a lot. Um, okay, synthesize. Synthesizing is hard for our brains, um, which I'm sure you can relate to. Okay, so yes, we ha we have what I call as a more sensitive nervous system, um, meaning like that window of tolerance, that, that window when we're in a regulated zone. Um, is more narrow. So we're more mm. easily flip into a stress state. Now that could look like that fight flight kind of act like hyperactivation, but it could also look like fogging out mild dissociation. And there's some research that suggests autistic people are more prone than non autistic people to respond to stress by going into that hypo arousal state. Um, which in polyvagal theory is that's that, um, that that kind of ventral shutdown or dorsal shutdown. Um, so yeah, I think polyvagal, I, polyvagal theory, and I think there's some really helpful concepts from it. I think it can at times oversimplify things, but I, I draw from it a lot. I also mm. add to it um, because I've I think seen, it just, I've seen some like sort of various sort of um devices that pe people have like created to like stimulate like the vagus nerve and stuff like that yeah. what do you think about that those types of things <laughs> i so i've started experimenting with that this year um i bought the oh my gosh i'm blanking on words um sensate and i really like it um the other one that i see a lot that kind of and this one's a lot more economical so i love tens units tens units give you yeah like a repetitive electrical pulse and you can actually buy ear clips and connect it to the tens unit. And that's also a vagal nerve stimulator. Um, I used to be a safe and sound protocol provider and that's also that stimulates the vagal nerve. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there's some on the market that are kind of gimmicky. Um, yeah. So I think that's just always good to, to know whenever something becomes popular, people are going to come sell, stuff because we can ways also stimu stimulating it and <laughs> yeah exactly we can also stimulate it like every time we laugh every time we chant or hum or sing we're stimulating our vagus nerve or that that's why deep breathing like you that's such a common like take a deep breath um when we fill our our um when we f what am i words words are not no, i know, I know. So like when you when you breathe in You'd when you breathe in and not take. just at your chest, then it activates like that slow, deep breath, especially mm. that slow exhale is what activates the, the vagus nerve. I tried um, um, the what, Wim, Wim Hof breathing method because I think one of the issues that I had when psychotherapists were encouraging me to try out sleep, um, so, so not sleep stuff, breathing related things is that I think due to the alexithymia, I couldn't really tell if it was making an impact mm -hmm. on me. But I tried I the Wim Hof, the Wim Hof one, which was like pretty much borderline hyperventilating for about you know, like thirty breaths, and then like so that's to activate. And, were you yeah. were you doing that to active like to get energy? And then you hold you hold your breath, and then you mm -hmm. let out the breath very 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 slowly mm -hmm. to like bring up the sympathetic and then bring it down. I think it's some, something to do with like coping with like stress and also mm -hmm. like, cause I did feel very relaxed after and also I experienced well, a lot of tinnitus, but. Huh. I wonder, I mean, I don't, I don't know the science of that 
specific breathing technique, but just hearing you describe it, I wonder if it's partly aimed to increase our heart rate variability, the way you're like kind of manipulating breath, which Possibly. that's mm -hmm. heart rate variability, which is different than heart rate, um, tends to be low for autistic and ADHD people. And that's one of the measurements that measures like basically how flexible and how strong that, that vagal tone is. Um, mm. And that breathing kind of sounds like it would maybe be an exercise that would help increase heart rate variability. But I'm kind of riffing here because I don't know the science of that specific breath work. I think it's, it's definitely good good for me, both for relaxation. I mean, not while I'm doing it. It's quite like, I mean, it, it stimulates your anxiety. So it's like, but it, but it also, I think because you are take, taking on that stress in a, in a controlled fashion, I think as, mm -hmm. as Sarah's, Sarah's talking about in the chat, you're taking all that stress in a controlled fashion. And so you're sort of learning how to cope and sort of breathe through like stress and yeah. stuff, which is. Hmm. So it's also exposure. Like it's also safe exposure around like, cause, mm. cause it's in your control and it's like, okay, I can survive this experience. Um, mm. I like that. It, um, so yeah. someone was asking about uh, pain and sleep. Like, um, oh yeah that would be another of the like buckets a lot of us have chronic pain um and so absolutely that is going to impact sleep as well um and that's where ideally if you have chronic pain you're working with your medical team on on managing that and there are specific strategies around that as well um the the relaxation and the CBTI also becomes really helpful there because anything that quiets down the nervous system is going to help with pain. But when we do that, we have to do it in a way where we're not invalidating the pain. A lot of times when we start talking about behavioral interventions to help us manage life with pain, um, if it's not done with a lot of nuance, it can feel really invalidating of our pain. I um, same, same with like po positive toxic yeah. positivity and stuff like yeah. that that we you know so holding the balance of like there are things that help our nervous system relax which helps the pain experience and the pain is not all in our head like to hold the both of those um, um yeah and also I tense suppose, units i think can be helpful with depending on the pain i suppose like one one last thing i'd, I'd like to to mention would be like things related to like supplements because i know there's a lot of like I, I have a big interest in like supplements that i have for a long time and like me medical not, not medical like um herbal things like related to sleep I, I do find that and i have seen it in some other places that like autistic people can struggle sort of developing like gl glycine or something and so i do find that um, like protein shakes, particularly on a night, help me a lot. And I think that's maybe because of like the tryptophan that's that's in the protein, mm -hmm. like helping with like serotonin development. And um, I also heard some stuff and and use um, like CBD uh, that that was that's been quite helpful for me on the evening, just to like quieten my brain. Not necessarily just for feeling sleepy, but it like quietens my default mode network and um I've, I've seen some some other stuff like obviously magnesium and things like that is there anything mm -hmm. else that pro props into your mind and, i mean there's things that pop in my mind but i also have to be careful about yeah, not giving yeah, um yeah. medical yeah. advice i i think i generally i recommend people work with with their provider but yeah we t we do tend to have more kind of um deficiencies in our like minerals and vitamins so if we can identify what those are um, like you mentioned magnesium is a common one the one thing melatonin i have a mixed relationship to because technically melatonin supplementation can decrease dopamine which like what autistic really? person needs less dopamine but also not getting sleep impacts neurotransmitters so that's when personally in my life i'm constantly going back on the pros and cons because melatonin does help me sleep. Um, so I, I just think it's wise to remember just cause it's a supplement doesn't mean we don't have to be 
thoughtful about it because all of these things impact each other. So I, I recommend people work with their medical team when possible. No, for sure, for sure. Um, which is maybe yeah, just I'm, my I'm way not of saying. Not saying go go out and try the things that I'm saying, guys. Just I'm not a professional. But there are like, there so. are like I think it's a really great point. There are supports um, that are that are out there, especially mm -hmm. given our bodies do tend to have more imbalances. Yeah, I've tried. I've tried um, like the typical ones, like lemon balm. What was it? Pa passion flower. Um, I've tried. Was the was the other one uh, Valerian root? Valerian root is mm -hmm. kind of it did work, but also gave me restless legs, so I tend to stay mm -hmm. away from them. But I mean, so so much to talk about as as always, and um, but I know I know that you've you've got to you've got to go to sort stuff out. So very much appreciate you coming on to talk, and for anybody who is on here, please make sure go check out. Megan's stuff, Neurodivergent Insights, the website and the books and such, and also um, the Instagram page and the podcast. I'm giving, I'm giving you your, your social media spe spiel for you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I'm really bad at giving my own spiel, so thank you for uh, doing the labor for me. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure, Megan. It's been really good to see you again, Thomas. All righty. Take care. Well, guys, I hope you have enjoyed this episode of the 40 OT podcast. And if you have, please make sure to subscribe. If you're on YouTube, please make sure to follow over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, what is the other one? Google Podcasts. If you're on any of those, please give the podcast a rating. And uh, if you want to see, see some more stuff from Megan, just let me know because um, I'm always very, very keen to have her on to speak about everything autism. But I hope you have a very good day and I will see you next week for another episode of the 4040 podcast. See you later. <laughs>